ye mountains high where the clear blue sky arches over the vales of the free where the pure breezes blow and the clear streamlets flow how i've longed to your bosom to flee oh zion This is Ben McClintock and Enoch Moore of DefendingUtah.org, where we think right and wrong, not right and left. Don't forget to subscribe to the Defending Utah YouTube channel. You can also find us on Spreaker, iTunes, and iHeartRadio. We'd like to give a shout out to our show sponsor, Medical Cost Share. Be sure to go out there and take the initiative to become the wrench in the works of Obamacare. This is the opt-out, it is legal, and it is totally exempt from any tax or penalty, and it is not insurance, it is better. I've got it, go get it, medicalcostshare.com slash opt-out now. And that said, Ben and Enoch, uh, we're ready for your wonderful guest. We are so grateful to have Hannah Stoddard of the Joseph Smith Foundation at josephsmithfoundation.org as well as ldsanswers.org. Make sure on the LDS Answers to remember the org. Thanks for uh, joining us, Hannah. Sherilyn, did you put the right there? There we go. Hannah, you're on. It would be nice if I turned on the (laughs) phone for you, Hannah. Welcome. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. So on your website, ldsanswers.org, you've got um, some... And you gave some presentations at the recent uh, Book of Mormon Expo about uh, historians being used to be able to change the history. And I think that's an important thing for our listeners to remember. There's this quote by George Orwell, who wrote the book 1984. What year did he write that book? Uh, not in 1984. Oh, okay. it, was before, it was a couple years before that. But <laughs> um, in, not in the book, but, but George Orwell, the author, said that the best way to destroy a people is to obliterate and destroy their understanding of their own history. And so there's these historians that, uh, that appear or that um, play the part of being faithful that are working on an organized effort to destroy our understanding of history. And I just want to let our listeners know that, yes, we're going to focus a little bit more on the LDS aspect of it, but this is something that is affecting all religions. This is something, the same exact tactic. So what we want to do is have you listen to the tactic, and this is happening to every religion out there. And so you can see how it's being applied here in this, in this specific example. But this has been something that's been going. There's been books written about how it was done in the 1960s to Protestants, and it's just something that um, we can be aware of. But helping people understand how this is happening and what the agenda is behind it is really important. So kind of introduce that for us, Hannah. Right, correct. And even if you are not a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, really this issue still applies to you, not only from the aspect that you mentioned, of course, regarding uh, this entire, uh, this agenda to rewrite history. Of course, we saw this with, um, you see this with the the criticism of the Bible, uh, the criticism of the Old Testament, the New Testament, but Joseph Smith is arguably one of, if not the most influential American. I mean, it would be hard to think of another American who's left their mark and changed the world, whether you believe he was a charlatan, whether you believe he was a prophet, whether you believe he was righteous or wicked, he left an incredible mark. And understanding what is going on, understanding this progressive effort to change the history and move away from a foundation, it's a critical thing to understand. And um, I, to just start out, so we pu- recently published, we being the Joseph Smith Foundation, through our latest project, LDS Answers, which, just really quick, LDS Answers is an organization that is dedicated to answering all of the tough questions, all of those Mormon stumpers that are um, a lot, that we really have a, a recent growing number of thousands of Latter-day Saints that are struggling with their faith. They're coming across things that Joseph Smith said, Joseph Smith did, and they're beginning to realize, wait, I've never heard about this before. Where are answers to these questions? And so LDS Answers is a place where we want to provide answers for those questions because we believe they exist. So we recently published a new article on LDSanswers.org titled, The Dominant Church History Narrative is Not True, 
end quote, LDS scholars encourage new history, new policy, and new church. And really this started uh, a couple months ago. Richard Bushman, he is the, a prominent LDS historian. He's considered by some to be the world's foremost scholar on Joseph Smith and early Mormonism. And he was giving a fireside and was asked the question, uh, one of the participants asked, do you see room in Mormonism for several narratives of a religious experience? This is a direct quote. The um, questioner asked, do you think that in order for the church to remain strong, they would have to hold to that dominant narrative? Now, what do they mean by dominant narrative? They're speaking of the traditional history that's been given to us by men like Willard Richards, who was president at the martyrdom in Carthage, or Wilford Woodruff, or Smith, or uh, more of the ideology of a President Benson or past presidents of the church. And Richard Bushman responded, he said, quote, I think that for the church to remain strong, it has to reconstruct its narrative. The dominant narrative is not true. It can't be sustained. And then he speaks of how we really need to change our history. And he said it's going to be hard, hard for a lot of people, older people especially, but it has to change. And that's kind of funny because... Right here, this conversation we're having, it's not the older generation. You're correct. You know, this is this is the yeah. the generation that he's saying was going to be easy for us to change, and so we need to people in 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 your age group and then my age group, which would be the next kind of the next step, and then and in Sherilyn's, we all need to be able to stand up and realize that this is a specific attack on the helping us to obliterate ourselves mm-hmm. by obliterating our history. Somebody sat around a table one day. And said, how do we get those Mormons to think something different about who they are? And they came up with a strategy. Of and, changing and this history. Is, this type of thing is evidence of that strategy. And, and he's it's admitting so it's important. a strategy. I do not, correct. And I don't think the public realizes that this discussion is even really going on. And it's been going on for several decades. It's just um, recently beginning to come out a little bit more. But I believe it's really important that both sides are presented that we understand okay this is more the progressive perspective and we'll talk a little bit more about what the what is what do they mean by this reconstructed narrative what are they talking about when they call for this new era and a new, a new Joseph Smith a new church culture what are they talking about and then understand okay what is the traditional perspective what's more the scriptural perspective how are they different and then if we can have that discussion and we can have that presented to the public and where anyone can understand it, my age group, um, which would be the early 20s, young single adults, and then you have more of the um, older generation, if everyone could see both sides, study out the issues for themselves, then they can come to an informed decision. My concern is that at present this discussion is not going on. This, these issues are not being are not we're not being upfront about the different positions, the different um, agendas, different perspectives, and we really need to be able to have civil, constructive discussion about these issues so we can really air this out. Well, that's good. It's important to be able to do that. I know you wanted to make sure that people understood. You know, there's an Alinsky tactic to be able to you know just you just call people's name, pay, call people names that differ. In opinion from you, you just instead of attack, instead of addressing the issue, and I think that on your website you talked about LDS answers being something that a, a, a place where people can talk about this, in a, even if they disagree, in a respectful tone. Right, right. It's very, very important, um, both to me and to everyone at the LDS Answers and Joseph Smith Foundation team, that. We have civil discussion that it's respectful, and all sides are presented, and so there's no censoring of different perspectives. Very important. Great. Hey, uh, Hannah, we've got a caller um, that has a question for you. We've got Chris on the line. Mm -hmm. Chris, you're on the Liberty Lineup radio show. Hi, guys. It's more of a comment. Um, I will give you an example of how members of the church, or maybe of the church itself, has revised its history. Down in the Manti pageant, they used to portray the martyrdom of Joseph Smith with him discharging his six-shooter down the stairwell. They no longer do that. I don't know if you've noticed that. I think that's to appease uh, gun control advocates. That's interesting. And, that, yeah, a lot of people don't realize that, you know, a, a person had a gun in prison. 
and that's well, not, not that's, only. Go not ahead. only, yeah, the, <laughs> I don't think they let them have a firearms in prison today. But let me tell you something else, and I will form this in in the, in the form of a quiz: Did or did not Joseph Smith shoot and kill a man while he was living here on Earth? All right, good question, Hannah. Your comment on that? Did Thanks. you know about that? Well, this? I. I'm, I am not prepared to answer that question, but with that on Elias answers, and I'm sure we could cover that. Well, and, and if that question hasn't been answered there, uh, Hannah, <laughs> maybe that would be a good one to have some research on. And maybe well, one I of our listeners know. Oh, Chris has the answer. Go for it, Chris. <laughs> that, was a, that was a rhetorical question, you know, so you, I do have the answer. You're, you're a smart yes, man people, because you never ask a question you don't have the answer <laughs> to, right? Okay, go ahead. No, I, Good advice. No, uh, Mr. Townsend, I don't have the first name, but Parley P. Pratt caught up with him. Now, the thing is, he didn't die immediately. He was shot in the shoulder by Joseph Smith. His injury continued to putrefy, and after a period of nine months, he he finally died of his injuries. So, yes, Joseph Smith did shoot and kill a man. I know a lot of people in the church would not like to publicize that fact, but it is true nonetheless. Uh, Chris, you always have great comments to make, and by the way, a little inside here for you since you've called. Uh, you won one of those books, and it's down there at center stage for you. Okay, Sherilyn, thank you very much. I you hope to betcha. meet you down there. Yeah, but uh, Chris's daughter is a dancer at center stage, so um, we hope that we'll encounter each other down there when we get my, uh, uh, my master classes up and going. So anyway... Thanks, Chris. You're great. We appreciate your calls. And you bet. Thanks for the show. Now, Chris brought up an important point that I think um, we should clarify for our listeners here. When um, There's two aspects when, when uh, someone gets into studying church history. One is not being aware of different events that happened in early church history, such as Joseph Smith having a gun at Carthage Jail, such as Joseph Smith um, involved in polygamy. You have all of these different things that people began studying and they haven't heard of before. And now that's one aspect. I want to make it clear this, the, the, the progressives that we're speaking of here, um, the Richard Bushmans, and we'll talk later about several others, there's Ron Barney, Greg Prince, Margaret Young, uh, they have a different perspective. Their concern is not so much about history that maybe is not being told or getting to know the real Joseph Smith from his own words or his own writings. This is about reconstructing the history. And just as an example, um, to back that up, so you don't take my word for it, um, Richard Bushman himself, he made a statement about a month after that fireside I mentioned earlier, where he um, clarified what he was meaning when he spoke of a reconstructed narrative, and he said, I consider rough stone rolling a reconstructed narrative. He said it was shocking to some people. Now, for those who don't know, rough stone rolling is the biography that Richard Bushman wrote on the prophet Joseph Smith. And he said, he said, they could not, they being the readers, could not bear to have the old story disrupted in any way, Um, end quote. And then he goes on and talks about how we really need to readjust to all of these findings. Now, what does he mean? What, what consists of this reconstructed narrative? Well, let's talk a little bit about what does rough stone rolling portray Joseph Smith as? Well, number one, um, in the first 50 pages alone, uh, Joseph Smith was, quote, involved in magic, end quote. That's page 53. Um, Joseph, the, Joseph Smith's involvement in, quote, magic was a preparatory gospel, and quote, quote, remnants of the magical culture stayed with him to Sorry, the end. Well, we've got to head off to going. the break right now. And so he's, he's not just doing history. It's about propaganda. And he's putting more than just facts into the book. All right. Cheryl and Eager with Ben and Enoch from Defending Utah. We will be back with Hannah Stoddard from the Joseph Smith Foundation talking about the infiltration of all churches, including the LDS Church. Call us at 801-254-5855. The all-new K-Talk Media, online at ktalkmedia.com. Let freedom ring. Why do you think that a recession is coming? Just how bad is it going to be? Many free market economists predicted it would come and worried about it. I think it's going to be pretty bad, and whether it starts in 07 or 08, I think, is immaterial. And I also think it's going to last not just for quarters, but for years. There's a difference between knowing the path and walking the path. 
The smart money was warning of the 08 housing and market crash. But did we move our 401ks or IRAs? No, because we didn't know for sure. And you have penalties and huge roadblocks. Today, we know better. Today, we have AccuPlan. They can set up a self-directed IRA or 401k and more. When we say go, in as little as 30 days, our 401k or IRA is in a new structure, one we control. Now we can use that structure for land or property, physical precious metals, ownership in a company we know locally, or our own startup. AccuPlan builds the structure. We control and have access to what we put into it. Visit them online and learn more about your options at AccuPlan.net. That's ACCUPlan.net. AccuPlan, builders of financial freedom. It's another Retirement Minute with Manny. Did you know Americans are more concerned about running out of money than of death? Consider this. Will you have enough income in retirement? The challenge to answering this question is that everyone is different. A strategy for one person is not right for another. Thus, the need for a retirement professional to help you meet this challenge. Let Manny Negron share six important questions to help you plan for your retirement income. To get you started, let him send you the complimentary retirement preparation kit he shares with all his clients. No obligation. You'll find the financial insights, tips, and things you can do to help retire successfully someday. You should have a retirement income plan. So to get a copy of this complimentary kit, just visit retirewithmanny.com. That's retirewithmanny.com. Gen Wealth Advisory Group is an independent financial services firm helping individuals create retirement strategies using a variety of investment and insurance products to custom suit their needs and objectives. Hi, it's Sherilyn Eager with the Liberty Lineup Show. As a mom and a grandma, I really care about my family's health. Over the years, I've been the one to find the doctors and services. So if you're like me, I was deeply troubled by the Obamacare mandate and its invasion of my privacy. But now, I've found an alternative that gives me and my family freedom from insurance. It's called Medical Cost Share, and we absolutely love it. Medical Cost Share exempts us from the Obamacare mandate, including the IRS penalties. And we can choose and keep our doctors and hospitals because there are no networks, no HMOs, no PPOs, and we can take it with us anywhere in the country. It even includes naturopathic and other alternative treatments. I love that the shared expenses do not include abortion services or other socially objectionable practices. And the best part is it costs a whole lot less. For a special offer for our listeners, go to medicalcostshare.com forward slash opt out now. That's medical costshare.com forward slash opt out now. It's not insurance. It's better. Call connected through the NSA. Complete transmission through the NSA. Suspending your rights for the duration of the permanent war. Welcome back to the Liberty Lineup. This is the Thursday edition with Ben and Enoch from Defending Utah, The Naked Truth. And we have a special guest with us. Her name is Hannah Stoddard from the Joseph Smith Foundation. Uh, She's been walking us through the infiltration that virtually every church out there that uh, is trying to maintain their traditional values and history are being challenged and and even doctrines and history are being uh, rewritten and uh, Hannah, I just wanted to make a quick comment before we get back to you. As a young woman growing up in the LDS Church in Hollywood, California, I recall very distinctly that my parents were quite concerned about the progressives of that day, way back in the 50s and 60s. And there was an individual, of course, dialogue was the cutting edge, you know, the edgy edge of of LDS thought and Sterling McMurrin was the guy that was stirring the pot then now it is is apparently Richard Bushman has taken his place would you say are you still with us yes I am mm-hmm. sorry so she was just asking I'm about cut out there for just a moment sorry. Oh. oh okay anyway I was just uh, talking about how throughout history uh, when I was growing up, there were always those that were more progressive and wanting to alter the history or the ideology, the theology, whatever, of the church. This is happening everywhere. And so uh, in that day, it was Sterling McMurrin, uh, who was mm-hmm. one of the big ones. And, uh, of course, now today we've got Richard Bushman. And Sterling was a writer with dialogue. And then, of course, we've had more recently Sunstone. 
Um, where where does uh, FAIR LDS fit into all of this? Well, we can read a quote, actually, from FAIR Mormon's website in just a moment here. FAIR Mormon, sorry. <laughs> and I think it will be interesting. That there is there is some There are some in FAIR that would come from the more traditional perspective, but there are several that come towards closer to more of this progressive event. But, and like you said, right, it, it's something that's changed over time, where originally um, it's definitely been in the works for some time. Uh, Rough Stone Rolling is what we, the book we were discussing right before the break, and it is definitely an, a perfect example of this reconstructed narrative. And we were talking before a little bit about, in just the first 50 pages, how does it portray Joseph Smith? Because we were asking the question, is this just historians trying to say, you know, we need to get back to the primary sources. We need to get to know who the real Joseph Smith was. No, it's a different, it's a case of trying to rewrite our history. Uh, for example, um, Rough Stone Rolling, the first 50 pages, states that Joseph Smith was involved in magic. That's a direct quote. Um, he suffered from, quote, treasure-seeking greed. Uh, it even states that, quote, remnants of the magical culture stayed with him to the end, end quote. And so here's Joseph Smith at Carthage apparently still suffering from um, his magical past. Uh, the Smith family were drawn to, quote, treasure-seeking folklore. They saw magical formulas and rituals, end quote, as connected to their spiritual well-being. Uh, magic and religion melded in Smith family culture. It even portrays uh, Joseph Smith Sr. as a, quote, oft-defeated, unmoored father who, quote, partially abdicated family leadership, end quote. His life, quote, was blighted by shame. The Smiths were a struggling family. This is only in the beginning of 50 pages of Rough Stone Rolling, and they're, this, we're really only hitting the tip of the iceberg So, again, that's here. just propaganda. That's not actual, like, quoting uh, source material. That's just he, propaganda. He's rambling off what, what he he thinks with some loose And then they're sources. calling it a history, and people are celebrating him as some groundbreaking historian when it's just a propagandist. And I've seen it I've seen this before in history. The quickest way to rationalize away a miracle and and priesthood power is to say, "Oh, look, someone who just was into magic." Right? And well, that's that's been attempted throughout history even on Jesus, saying Jesus went to Egypt and learned magic as young. People who tried to debunk him. So Hannah, uh, if yeah. a person were to read this book, Rough Stone Rolling, is this a book whose intention is to strengthen the faith and conviction of the LDS member? What do you surmise the author's purpose was? Well, I would go straight to Richard Bushman himself. He was doing an interview with John DeLynn on Mormon stories, and he was at, he was describing this faith crisis that he experienced while he was studying at Harvard. And so John Dolan asked him, he said, how, how did you become a believer again or refine your believingness? And Bushman responded, he said, I probably never recovered at all. This is a direct quote. He said, I'm not someone who has a simple faith where just everything is absolutely true beyond any doubt, end quote. And I think that's an important perspective that people need to understand when they look at testimony, as um, Bushman says himself in his own words, they don't have a testimony in truth. They have a testimony in goodness. They see they see the gospel differently. They see uh, they see truth differently. They don't believe that you can actually know something. They believe um, that truth is something. If if, a, if if new findings were to come out tomorrow that the prophet Joseph Smith was a charlatan and now we have evidence to prove it, Bushman is open to that. He, he it's very uh, more of an intellectual, very a uh, um, perspective. And I think that's key to recognize. And let's take a look at his sources for a moment. Take a look at Rough Stone Rolling. Um, it's not historically accurate in several instances. For example, um, Richard Bushman, in trying to portray the Smiths as involved in the occult, involved in magic, says, this is a direct quote from page 51 to 50, 50 to 51, uh, Lucy Mack Smith showed her knowledge of formulas and rituals and associated them with the welfare of our souls. Magic and religion melded in Smith's family culture, end quote. So, of course, you have to say, okay, he must have a source, right? Where is he pulling this from? Well, he is pulling this from a quote 
from Lucy Max Smith, which he pulls out of context. And he uses Lucy Max Smith's statement to say, oh, she admitted the Smiths were involved in magic and involved in the occult. Well, when we look at the original source and look at it in context, we actually discover that Lucy Max Smith was saying the complete opposite. Um, she, um, and the entire quote we're going to have online on our LDS Answers website, but she goes into actually denying that they were involved in the occult. She says, I'm going to, she had been previously discussing the Smith family laboring on their farm, and then she says, now I shall change my theme for the present, but let not my reader suppose that because I shall pursue another topic for a season, because she's getting ready to head into the history of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. She, she says, don't suppose that just because I'm going into this history that we stopped our labor, stopped working on our farm, and went at trying to win the faculty of Abrac, drawing magic circles or soothsaying to the neglect of all kinds of business. In other words, what she's trying to say is, all of these anti-Mormon neighbors, the ones that were ducking Joseph Smith in the pond and trying to steal the plates from him and persecuting him, they were accusing the Smiths of being lazy and, and very indulging in magic and just treasure-seeking. And she says, no, that is not, I want to be clear, those stories are not true. We, um, we were hard, we were laboring hard, and we were also devoted to, to, and then she goes into the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. So Richard Bushman is pulling the statement out of context. When you look at it, it really any any high school student could look at that statement and say, okay, I can see what Lucy Max Smith is trying to say. But we really we live in this era where if someone has degrees, um, even if we can see the information is fabricated and twisted, oh, somehow he must know something we don't, right? And I think it's important to note that this is not a discussion between oh, this scholar who has studied versus this individual who has never studied. No. Um, my father, for example, has studied Joseph Smith for hours upon hours every day since he was really in his teens. And he has studied all of the same source, sources Richard Bushman has. He studied the journals of Joseph Smith. He studied the writings. And he comes to vastly different conclusions regarding the character of Joseph Smith. He does not come to the same conclusions Richard Bushman is. So it's not an issue of education. It's not an issue of looking at sources. It's an issue of a different perspective, a different worldview. And I think that's critical for people to recognize. Um, a lot of this comes out of the research or the, the uh, propaganda, I would like to call it, uh, from a woman, I'm, and her name is expa escaping my memory right now, but this was way back in the 50s. She wrote a book. and Von Brody? Yes, Von Brody. Thank you. Uh, this is, uh, seems to me to be regurgitation of her flawed information. Um, I, I just want to share with you uh, a, a quick story here. We've got a caller um, that we want to take. So... Uh, Enoch is going to take care of that. But uh, I, I know a woman who uh, gave Bushman's book to a couple of her sons. Uh, they were adults, and they were very strong, very strong testimonies in the church, had, you know, served missions. Uh, uh, they were um, assistants to the president on those missions. And those son sons uh, read that book, and they left the church. So uh, when I say, you know, what, what do you think his motive is really? I mean, maybe for him he is justifying uh, altering the truth for his own gratification. His, uh, maybe he likes to, uh, you know, push those buttons as an individual. And maybe it's his way of, of influence. I think it's interesting that uh, somebody that says that, the, that they're not a believer is writing a book that's supposed to be a history book, but there's not very much history in it. It's full of, of um, extrapolation and uh, interpretation as opposed to just saying, here's the facts. A history book, what, what, what I grew up learning, a history book was supposed to be was just a layout of facts and then you come to your own conclusion, but that's not at all what's going on here. And uh, I think it'd be good to go into the next. Um, we've got another, in, on your website, ldsanswers.org, um, there's no, it's not just this one author. I think that's what I wanted to focus on is that this is a coordinated effort with many different so-called um, 
historians in the church that are telling us that we need to rewrite our history, just like Orwell said we needed to do to destroy a people. There's um, Ronald Barney. Can you tell us more about um, that church uh, historian and what his uh, right. what he's saying? So Ron Barney, he was the executive director of the Mormon History Association. He admires the work of Richard Bushman, and he recently spoke just this year of talking about how we, he said, I, we, he, he said we've moved to a new era is what he called it. He said, this is new Mormon history. He said, we're in a new era. This is, we have a new Joseph Smith. He said specifically, he said, when I look back, because he's getting ready to release his own biography of Joseph Smith, he said, as I look at how Joseph Smith has been viewed in the past, and then I'll begin a quote here. He said, quote, how Joseph Smith has been represented over time, there is such a clear point of departure in what has happened in the last few years than all that happened previous to this, end quote. So they recognize this is a different Joseph Smith. They are very aware that this new church, this new history, this reconstructed narrative, this new Joseph Smith is different, and, and they think that is a good difference. Of course, someone from more of a traditional, more scriptural or biblical worldview would say, no, this is not the direction we would like to head. And that really comes down to each person deciding for themselves, which side will you take? I am looking at the Mormon History Association website right now, and uh, the name Robert Crandall appears. Is he the director at this point in time? And what are they continuing with this narrative? Well, Ron Barney, so he was, was the executive director, and right now he is currently working on this biography of Joseph Smith. But was he uh, one of the people like, working uh, on the was, Joe Smith papers as well, or is that somebody else? He, he was previously. Gotcha. Previously did serve as an associate editor. But like you said, um, Ben, which I think is a really good point to pick, point out, Bushman and, and even Barney, they're not the only ones. There are many scholars. For example, uh, Greg Prince, um, he, he has called for all those who believe in the historicity of the Book of Mormon to, quote, grow up. And if you're not aware of what he means by believing the historicity of the Book of Mormon, um, he's referring to this, it's actually a new movement among many LDS progressives to believe that the Book of Mormon narrative is allegory. Mormon, Moroni, Nephi, Captain Moroni, the Stripling Warriors never physically existed. Um, they were, it's, the Book of Mormon is inspired fiction. And so that may sound shocking to many Latter-day Saints, but it's actually a, a, a belief, a, a perspective that's becoming more prev- prevalent. And I've heard a lot of actually Prince, BYU professors try to promote that idea as well. True. And so Greg Prince himself, he said, there are many who are willing to die on the hill of ancient historicity. He said, if that's you, to, quote, to them I say, grow up, end quote. And so, so like that's you an said, it's tast- not about... tactic. That's not even addressing facts. They're just saying you're a child and I don't even have to address you because anybody that's a grown-up understands that it's fiction. And that's, instead of actually having a discussion, they just name-call. And it's this, it's this issue where we have, we have a different worldview. I think that's what is so important for people to understand and become aware of. And that's why I believe it's so important that discussion is opened up on these issues, because right now we don't have open dialogue. We don't have discussion. We don't have um, people don't feel comfortable talking about these different arguments, these different perspectives, different events in past church history. And we really need to open up the discussion, be able to discuss these things so that we can come up, be up front. Where do you stand? Here's where I stand. And let's look at the sources to back it up. Uh, We are going to a quick break here. Hannah, we'd like you to stay with us. And this is Hannah Stoddard from the Joseph Smith Foundation. We are talking about progressive alterations to Mormon history. It's happening in all churches. And, in fact, this has already happened to the mainstream churches years ago. We'll be back. the top of the Rocky Mountains. K-Talk Media, live, local, two-way, AM 630. We provide truth. You decide. Online at ktalkmedia.com.
Hi, this is Alan Blood with Capital Financial Group. With home values increasing and low rates still available, now is the perfect time to refinance your home. Capital Financial Group, we have loan programs to fit your refinance needs, whether you want to pull cash out from your home, decrease your interest rate and monthly payment, or just reduce your loan to a 15-year payoff. We have programs that will help you refinance even if your income or credit is less than it used to be or if you're underwater on your mortgage. Instead of getting lost in the shuffle of a big bank or paying high fees at a credit union, call us and we'll help you refinance with the best rates and lowest closing costs for you. You may even qualify for one of our no-closing-cost loans. Call me today, Alan Blood, at 801-298-5887 to start saving money on your mortgage now. 801-298-5887, NMLS number 3146. I just met with my CPA and I'm pretty ticked off. He told me that I owe the Obamacare penalty of over $2,000 to the IRS on top of all my other taxes because I didn't have a qualified health plan last year. And he tells me that the penalty is going to be even higher this year. Luckily, I'm not going to have to deal with that anymore. I decided to opt out of the whole Affordable Care Act, including the IRS penalties. How is that possible? I just heard about a medical cost-sharing organization. And as a member, I'm exempt to the ACA individual mandate and the IRS penalties. I do get to keep my doctor because there are no networks, no HMOs, no PPOs. I can go wherever I like. Best of all, I'm paying a lot less than I was for health care. You should check it out, too. All the information you need is at medicalcostshare.com. If it makes sense, you can even enroll online. It's so easy. Once again, medicalcostshare.com. I promise you'll be glad you did. Medicalcostshare.com. It's not health insurance. It's better. Welcome back. It's Sherilyn Eager, and this is the Thursday edition, Naked Truth, with Ben and Enoch from Defending Utah. We have as a special guest Hannah Stoddard from the Joseph Smith Foundation. Uh, The subject is how modern progressive historians have been altering the original text and history of religion in general, uh, specifically Uh, with the LDS history. And Hannah, I have here in front of me on my laptop right now um, the name Jeremy Bentham. And the reason I wanted to share this is because uh, this progressive switch from the scripture being uh, accurate and and full of uh, the, the accounts of miracles and so forth of course, we know there are some translation inaccuracies, but um, the the stories themselves, that there were witnesses that bore witness to those events in history and that they did bear witness to the miracles. Uh, but then you have people, this is in 1748, no less, that he was born. So he's an English philosopher, Jeremy Bentham, and he's the known as the founder of modern utilitarianism. So what is useful, all right? And uh, and he was amongst those, even way back then, that were undermining this idea that there could ever be miracles and that God really could speak to man. So I see this as an extension that, you know, the LDS faith is newer, younger than the others, and it's hitting our faith now. What What would you say about that? Absolutely, absolutely. It reminds me of in another scholar, Todd Compton, um, towards this progressive bent. And I would like to, I, I just want to mention to all of the listeners, it, every statement from a, any of these progressive historians that I've mentioned so far are on LDSanswers.org. You can read their full statements. You can listen to their full audio, video. Don't take our word for it. Go on the website, and you can see the full sources behind it. But, uh, Sherilyn, your comments were reminding me of Todd Compton. So he is an LDS um, author, historian, and he wrote on the plural wives of Joseph Smith. And in his book, In Sacred Loneliness, he talks about 
miracles in this as folklore. He speaks of them as this kind of neo-biblical psychic, um, specifically commenting on Mary Elizabeth Rollins, and she had an experience where one of the three Nephites came to her. And his twist, when he reads that story, he said, quote, a three Nephite story is a necessary part of any repertoire of the miraculous in early Mormonism. And then later on he talked about, in other words, what he's saying is, this is just kind of this strange folklore from our past. As he said later, he said, in speaking of Eliza Snow, he said, miracle and prophecy, they're part of this neo-biblical psychic environment in which the early Mormons lived. He said this was a product of, their, they were products of their culture, this early Mormon worldview. And that's really how they see it. That was the past church. We're now a more enlightened people in this new church. Uh, Margaret Young, she was a, she is a part-time faculty member at BYU. And she wrote an article called The Future of Mormonism, The Next Five Years. And she said in that article, quote, The future of Mormonism is bright. We are on a bridge. She said, change comes, comes slowly in the church, but to those seeking to find miracles, the changes over the past 50 years have been monumental. So she's seeing a change, and what is that change? She says, quote, we will become a church known for exactly the opposite reasons it was known for in the 19th century, end quote. Uh, we have and a, later. okay, we have a mm -hmm. caller. Go ahead. And so let's mm -hmm. go to this caller. Carl, welcome to the show. How are you? Yeah, hi. Uh, I have a different perspective on Joseph Smith. Uh, I like to read and uh, research uh, the criminal record of Joseph Smith from Bainbridge, New York, all the way to Nauvoo. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, he was above the law. He, can, uh, he, uh, he was engaged in money digging. He was in, engaged in an illegal bank in Kirtland. He, engaged in uh, polygamy against uh, Missouri, Ohio, uh, Illinois laws. He uh, uh, illegally destroyed the Nauvoo Expositor when the, uh, the Constitution of Illinois gave the power only to juries to stop uh, newspapers. Mayors uh, did not have that power. He violated the Illinois Constitution, which led to his death. Uh, I mean, those are just a few of the, the crimes he's committed. Uh, uh, another one is uh, the, uh, the he was uh, pronounced king of the uh, the Council of Fifty. He sent representatives to Texas, which was independent at the time. He wanted to take over the entire uh, West, which was not uh, American territory at that time. All right, Carl, uh, yes. you've made some declarations there, and I think, in all fairness, we need to allow our guest to respond, and perhaps Ben and Enoch have some response as well. Thank you so much for taking the time to call. We appreciate it. Thank you. All right. That was uh, yes. uh, uh, did you? Yeah. <laughs> did you uh, collect the checklist there? Right. Well, since I don't have very much time left in this hour, this is what I would say to um, our caller and all of our listeners. There are good answers to all of those uh, points he brought up. In the Joseph Smith's history, is it accurate? Are points that are accurate? How do you understand them? There are real answers to all those questions. Um, go to LDSAnswers.org. We talk about some of them there, and we'll have more content coming out soon on almost all of the points that he mentioned. And you'll take on the challenge to answer any question anyone has that wants to submit to you. Yes, is that please. right? Ab all right. Absolutely. Send us, please. Send us your questions. Send us um, anything you have, concerns and we will do our best to get to it as we can. I think it's kind of interesting that somebody would accuse somebody of being a criminal. There's been several studies that go out and say that all of us commit about seven felonies a day. There you go. We're so we're all, all multiple felons every day. <laughs> yeah. Hannah, uh, have you ever encountered a historian whose name is Martha Bradley? I have not myself. Okay. My dad may have, but All I right. have not myself. I would like to connect with you after we're off the air. Uh, she wrote a book called Pedestals and Podiums, and this was in 2005. Uh, it's about the women's movement. It's about the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, I was on the forefront of that in, in Illinois and worked directly with Vivian Adams, who was Bruce R. McConkie's daughter. Mm -hmm. And, yes, uh, and I before. have a lot to say about this. I've actually done a critique 
of this book. She actually credits me, without naming me, for stalling her book for seven years, for which I am <laughs> very proud. And uh, But her book is full of fallacies, and I know because I was a witness and I was there. And so we have history right there that has been rewritten. And actually the BYU Library contacted me um, way back then, and they wanted all of my records from that movement and that era because uh, he did say this was an archivist. He did say that we needed the other side of the story for students at BYU, and I still have all of that documentation. I need to get in touch with you. Yes, absolutely. The, the Especially the story of women in the LDS Church, I personally feel, has not been told um, from it the hasn't. traditional perspective. It's been completely lost. It's like, um, and, and different uh, historians and progressives like Margaret Young, the lady I was referencing just a couple minutes ago, the, the perspective they have on our history is that this is a past we need to, you know, be forgiving of, move on from as quickly as possible. As Margaret Young herself said, she said, quote, it's kind of like when the Salt Lake Temple was constructed on the foundation of sandstone that was simply not adequate to hold up. And the instructions came down, tear it down, it's got to come down, tear it down so you can build it on something that will last, end quote. And that, so that's how they see our history. It's something that is faulty, it will, is not adequate to hold up. We need to tear it down. As she said, I have to just pinch my nose as I read through the terrible things that have been said by past presidents of the church. Again, all of this is documented on so our So these article. are LDS historians that are saying we need to destroy the foundation yes. that we were founded upon. And so that's not a religion that they actually believe in. As Richard Bushman himself admitted, he was not a believer. They're staying, it seems like, so if you don't believe in a foundation of a religion, that's something that's like either it's true or it's not, and you're staying there, it's because of another agenda. And it, it because of history, it just really reminds me of what George Orwell said, that this, was, this is how you destroy a people is by destroying their history. What we really need to be doing is embracing our history and then seeking to understand the things we don't understand. Right. We should fully embrace embrace it as it is. And even M. Russell Ballard, just in the last couple months, said, encouraged reading our history and answering questions, but doing it with intellectual honesty and looking at both sides, which is what uh, Hannah's been talking about. Okay. We have a caller. And uh, Tom, welcome to the show. We just have about 30 seconds. Tom, are you there? Okay, I guess Tom is not there. Uh, Hannah, uh, if you would, uh, give us again how people can get in touch with the Joseph Smith Foundation and the questions and answers. And we, I would, I would love to have you back on again. This has been a, a very important conversation, and I have to credit Ben and Enoch here for uh, making this connection. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Yes. So if anyone is interested, you can go to josephsmithfoundation.org or specifically our newest project, which is ldsanswers.org. If you go to ldsanswers.org, on the homepage is this new article, The Dominant Church History Narrative is Not True. LDS Scholars Encourage New History, New Policy, New Church. And in that article is laid out many of these different scholars you can listen to the audio all the sources to back it up and then as also we on that website ldsanswers.org we're really trying to provide real answers to all of the tough questions in lds church history and doctrine i think it's very critical we need to be able to have this discussion and have a place that's a safe environment for everyone of every perspective to be able to come together and come because that is when truth will only truth is, will only come to the surface when all sides are presented All right, my friend, Hannah Stoddard from the Joseph Smith Foundation, thank you so very much for what you are doing to keep history truthful. And we look forward to having you back again. I appreciate so much defending Utah. Tell us what people can do to become involved in what you are organizing here in Utah. Really hope people will go to DefendingUtah.org. Also subscribe uh, to our YouTube channel, Defending Utah YouTube channel, where we have a lot of our presentations. We just recently put up one of our booklets that helps people understand why it's important to understand seer combinations and, and political machinations in our day, and then that there's a solution, that there's something we can do about it. And that's a vital thing that when people need to understand is that um, we have to have a proper diagnosis before we, have, before we can have a proper solution. And so we provide that diagnosis with the solution. 
This has been Ben McClintock and Enoch Moore of DefendingUtah.org. Make sure to subscribe to the Defending Utah YouTube channel. And also, we'd like to thank our sponsors, The Editor Lady. She will help you publish your book or do any editing for a price you won't believe. Give The Editor Lady a call at 801-948-3667. That's 801-948-3667. Or email her at theeditorlady at gmail.com. We all know that we need to get prepared for job loss, disasters, and just plain life. You need to go to emergencyseedbank.com. That's emergencyseedbank.com. Enter coupon code DEFEND.UT to get your deep discount on Urban Emergency Seed Bank of 23 varieties of non-hybrid, non-GMO seeds, double hermetically sealed in Mylar for seeds that last for decades emergencyseedbank.com coupon code defend.ut